Hello, everybody. Welcome to this week's episode of The Stack. Today, we'll discuss the evolution of endpoint security. And one of the things we're going to talk about today is the, you know, just exploring a bit about the ever-changing landscape of protecting devices in our client environments is such a critical aspect. Um, we're going to dive, uh, dive into some of the latest trends, technologies, strategies that are shaping the future of endpoint security. I am Dan Tomaszewski, your host, and I am joined today by Tate Harper. Uh, Tate is with Rat Locker. We have Tate Harper here. Uh, how are you doing today, Tate? Doing very well, Dan. Thank you for having me today. I, I really appreciate you being here. Um, you know, one of the things that, uh, you know, as I've indicated to our audience, we're going to talk about is just that evolution of endpoint security. And uh, I'm really going to date myself here as I talk about that evolution. Uh, because I've, I've been around long enough to, to have seen this entire evolution. Um, I remember the days when, you know, we would just slap antivirus onto a workstation and consider this security, right? And, um, you know, maybe we also added, you know, some type of a hardware firewall, um, you know, and it's not that, you know, we didn't take network security seriously. It's just that that level of protection match the threats that were out there. And, uh, and now, of course, you know, threats have evolved and progressed over time. And uh, so has our response to security. And, you know, we've moved from security being mostly a single tool or a, um, you know, just an individual thing like AV to more of that layered approach uh, to security. And, you know, one of the analogies that I used to use is, you know, we talked about the single pane of glass um, and the protection, you know, uh, you know, one bullet going through a pane of glass, um, pretty easy to get through. But when you have multiple panes of glass, you know, that helps to uh, keep that bullet from penetrating through much like security overall. That was, you know, just the, you know, the angle that we would always take. And, you know, I'm sure you've seen the same progression in your career. You know, I mean, we moved from AV to next gen, um, EDR, zero trust, and so on, right? Exactly. Um, and, and kind of seeing those changes over the years, um, exactly like you said, has, has followed the landscape and followed what the um, threats have, have kind of needed at the time. And, um, you know, now we've moved 30 years past that and have come a long way in terms of how we do things and and being able to um, see that evolution is, is interesting. Yeah, and I think, you know, we've we've really learned from our mistakes. Ultimately, um, security is no exception. Uh, now, that doesn't mean that everything that we've learned um, is being applied out there. I mean, because you and I both have seen, um, you know, different environments that are out there that you, you know, you, you scratch your head and wonder, why is this level of security in place here? You know, what is being overlooked? And, um, you know, and as MSPs, we owe it to our clients. Um, they, they trust us to provide them with the level of protection that's going to mitigate the threats that are out there. And, um, you know, we would expect that everybody um, would have moved away from the, you know, the, the allow everything unless explicitly denied and moved more towards and apply those principles to block by default and allow by exception. Um, but this idea to restrict user access to the minimum necessary permissions, you know, is, is required. Um, and it's, it's a no brainer. You know, it's, it's one of those things that we should have in place. Um, now, what I want to do is talk a little bit about zero trust overall and the zero trust approach. Um, can you give some some overall benefits? You know, what are those benefits to that zero trust approach um, in addition to more of a robust security posture? Yeah, definitely. Um, so, I mean, obviously, the, the first reason that zero trust was implemented is because of, you know, that security posture how do we make something that um, is only allowing the software that needs to be there um, and and anything else that comes into the environment is automatically blocked from a security standpoint fantastic um, however when we work when we work with these end users oftentimes um, you'll you'll run into the conversation of well i thought i was already protected because i have antivirus and then you sold me a next gen antivirus three years ago and then last year i i got this new edr like how do i still need 
something else from that point. Um, and then I, I like to often bring in just other aspects that um, win from the least privileged standpoint. And if you think about your users, um, you know, maybe you look at a accounting department, for example, and you deploy uh, a threat locker agent or a whitelisting tool and you see that, hey, there's, you know, 16 of these 25 people have Steam on their computers or, you know, accessing websites that they shouldn't be accessing, being able to not only protect them from things that could go wrong, but also be able to build operational efficiency um, within your end user organizations and, and say, hey, how about we make sure your employees are only accessing stuff they need to access to get their jobs done um, or also protecting intellectual property. Um, if the sales guys only need to access the sales data, why do they have access to all the data within the company? So let's restrict only things that they need to see um, to make sure that your intellectual property is protected, uh, not only from you know cyber threats, but also from you know users within the environment. There's no reason for um, you know everyone to be able to see everything. So we can really limit things down when you implement a, a zero trust architecture, not only from a application level, but also take it down to the storage or uh, focus on what you know user privileges need to be um, given to people. So. Um, you know, I often say build operational efficiency and protect intellectual property are, are two big wins apart from the security side of zero trust. You know, when you know you bring up a good point of, you know, here, you know, maybe five years ago we sold them this and, you know, two, three years ago we sold them that. Now we're coming, uh, you know, a, a different angle. Um, you know, I think we often have to, um, you know, help our clients understand you know, what worked yesterday doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work today. You know, we need to continue to evolve um, not only, you know, security tools, but also the, the various security practices. Um, you know, what are what are some of your thoughts as far as helping clients to understand that, you know, things are evolving and bad actors are becoming more sophisticated and why we need to continue to, you know, evolve and stay ahead of the game? Yep, definitely. I would say that I, I often bring up the point that, you know, application whitelisting zero trust has been, you know, used by the U.S. government for the past 30 years. Um, and it has been extremely strenuous. They have a massive team and a ton of manpower to make sure that that application whitelist continues to um, work and be seamless. And, and what's really changed um, in that time is that we've now figured ways to do that in a manageable um, way that's scalable as well. So being able to um, manage the updates is, is one of the biggest things that um, allows this to be something that can be brought down to MSPs. Um, and, and that's because when Patch Tuesday would come around and all those, you know, applications do update, all the hashes have changed and effectively makes your whitelist useless. Um, so really what ThreatLocker has done to kind of manage this, this change is we have about 3,800 built-in applications now um, that are managed by our applications team here in Orlando. Um, so as those updates come out, we either get them right away or in some circumstances get them before they come out um, from the vendors to make sure that when those um, updates do get pushed through, that the whitelist is still running smoothly. Um, and that's been a, a big kind of change in the way that um, you're able to bring yeah. this down to um, the, or over to the MSP level. So, you know, you, you brought up a good point about the U.S. government adopting this and having this in place for, for decades. Um, you know, if that's the case, you know, why is it um, not been adopted by more if the U.S. government has had this in place and has been using zero, zero trust for decades? Where, where do you where do you see the, you know, the reasoning behind that there? Um, I think I think that's going to be one fear or, you know, fear of the time management that it's going to take because it's been, um, you know, one way for so long, the ability to do it in a way that's manageable and especially manageable in a multi-tenant environment um, has not been feasible. Um, so, you know, being able to one, learn the environment and understand what actually needs to be there is extremely important to building that list, but two, being able to show that, Hey, this is actually, you know, I often say with threat locker specifically 90% of the work, is done for you by learning and cataloging what's actually going on in the environment and then you know we have another five or seven percent that's done by an engineer with threat locker walking you through you know 
hey, this is how we can future proof some of these policies to make this more feasible. Um, and then that last bit is really, you know, working with the end users and saying, hey, do you need these applications in the environment? Do you need to have Steam? Yes, the developers are allowed to play Steam after hours or no, they can, th their work computers, they can't have those. Um, so being able to um, bring in these strict controls in a way that's not scary um, has, has been the reason that, um, you know, things haven't moved faster than they maybe could have just because of that, you know, fear from the back of their mind, the way that um, the manpower used to have to be. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, one of the things that, you know, many clients have that pushback for is, um, you know, this is going to be, you know, it's going to be, uh, I guess the best word to say it is, uh, it's going to cause me havoc. It's going to, you know, disrupt my workflow and, um, you know, I mean, I think the most important thing is, is the easier that we make it for ourselves, the easier we make it for bad actors. But there that's not necessarily the case when you have the right tools, per se. Right. Exactly. Um, and I, I often make a, a kind of a silly analogy. Um, but, you know, lots of people have heard the analogy comparing, you know, endpoint security to your house. You need to protect your house. Consider that the endpoint. And the way that we've done it for the past 20 or 30 years is put a bunch of different security cameras all around the house, or maybe even in some circumstances, we're putting security guards around the house or in the in the you know living room saying, hey, if something does go wrong, we're going to see it, we're going to detect it and respond to it. Um, and, you know, you're hoping that maybe, you know, the person that lit your couch on fire that you catch it quick enough and put it out or the person that pushes over the china cabinet that hopefully the security guards inside the house can catch it and there's not too much damage um but really why are we letting all these people inside the house and that's been right. what's so challenging so being able to dictate that list to hey these are my 10 best friends that can come over to the house and that's it um and saying hey my daughter's boyfriend can come over, but he can only go to the living room and the refrigerator. He can't go to my liquor cabinet. He can't go to my daughter's bedroom. Um, being able to build controls and dictate who's inside that house. Think about how many times your security cameras are going to go off if there's 10 people there versus 100. Um, so when you look at operational efficiency and you look at the way that the MSPs have to manage things, right now they're managing in a detect and respond fashion. They are, they are reacting to everything. Instead, you could be proactive, have some front end work. Yes, it does have to be set up on the front end. However, we make that pretty easy. Um, but then stop chasing everything after the fact. Make sure it's your 10 best friends inside the house and just those 10 friends. Well, can we expand on that? Because, you know, when we talk about uh, putting in strict protocol, strict, um, you know, security mechanisms, uh, oftentimes we think about, you know, that headache that comes with it. Um, you know, we talk about the, you know, those challenges. How do we overcome that? Um, especially, most especially, given the fact that as MSPs, we're working in a multi-tenant environment, you know, in a, in a single corporate environment, um, you know, not that it's a lot easier. It is easier because you're talking about one environment. But, you know, if we're talking, you know, you're managing 10, 30, 50, 100 or more environments, um, that's a lot. You know, and uh, I think it can be daunting and that can hold uh, a lot of MSPs back. So how, how, we, how do we overcome this? Yep, definitely. And I would say the way that that um, is overcome is through the, the learning mode um, and also through the way that we've built the portal. Um, just because you can, it's a top down um, system. So, you know, you're, you're going to build your global policies first. You're going to have your RMM, your PSA, uh, whatever detection tools you have across the board will be there. And then everything else underneath that, all your child organizations, it's automatically going to be built for you as the agent is sitting there passively learning what needs to be there. Um, and then we have systems within Threat Locker that show you, hey, how many times would someone, if this machine was in a secured state, how many times would someone have gotten a pop up? How many times would someone have to have request a new application? So as the learning mode continues, you know, maybe it's seven days, maybe it's 10, maybe we're at 21 days in more dynamic environments. Um, you're going to see that number drop down. So we're really giving you a visual on exactly what the um, kind of response is going to look like um, from your end users as we kind of do the onboarding. So being able to um, you know, manage your clients in a way that's, um, you know, one, organized for you, but two, you know, in, in a way that is focusing on on their specific environments while still giving you the efficiencies of, you know, 
moving policies across computer groups is extremely valuable to um, MSPs that do want to um, bring this level of control in those multi-tenant environments, and we've made it extremely easy. Now, are there um, situations which, depending on the type of industry that the client may be in, that you have you know different protocols that you would apply? Um, does you know does Threat Locker allow for that, um, or is it you know one policy across the board? How how does that uh, work from a from an industry perspective, and maybe the regu the regulatory compliance that they might be under? Yep. So one thing that's uh, actually pretty recent with Threat Locker is called Threat Locker Community. Um, so for the most part, a lot of your policies are going to be built automatically just through that learning period. But maybe you run into a circumstance where it's a custom line of business software. Um, you know, sometimes you accounting software and dental software are both very hard to work through um, so you can move into the threat locker community and say hey these are some other threat locker partners that have also worked with this software um, and have built efficient policies for drake or for dentrix um, and and then being able to kind of use that community and you know the hive learning to make your policies most efficient is um, another piece that has you know made threat locker the tool when it comes to you know managing zero trust in in those multi-tenant environments okay yeah i think you know the strength of community is um you know is, is powerful right um because in, in in really when you think about the it channel um you know there there is not always that whole competitive you know people want to work together and help each other out so um that is truly a strength that i see overall um now, uh, a couple things that I want to do is, you know, can you get a little bit more in depth about what Threat Locker does, what specifically Threat Locker does? I mean, I think we've alluded to that quite a bit here, but, you know, just the ultimately, if, if I were to come to you today and say, you know, Tate, um, I want to learn more specifically what Threat Locker is going to do for me, how it's going to help me, what it's going to you know, eliminate, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what would be your, you know, 60 second elevator pitch from that perspective? Definitely. Um, so Threat Locker is an endpoint protection platform that's allowing what you need and denying everything else by default. So we're going to be able to give you this application allow listing um, in a way that's going to be smooth and manageable. And what that typically looks like is um, walking into an environment, deploying on an agent, letting it sit for seven to 10 days, and then circling back to look at that audit log and understand what applications are there. How do those applications need to interact with your files? How do your users need to interact with your files? And after we go through that learning put period for um, 10 or, or 14 days, then we're going to be able to start locking those machines down. And from that point, you'll see um, kind of over the first 30 days, maybe um, from your users, you're having 10 or 15 um, kind of alerts saying, hey, I, I need to use this payroll software. We didn't open this up in that initial learning period. You go in and allow that. And then as you move down um, the line from that initial onboarding, you will see those tickets drop more and more because at the end of the day, these environments are relatively static. Um, but walking through that process and understanding what's in those environments, what actually needs to be in those environments, let's just let those things run, um, is what we're going to do when we bring someone to Threat Locker and walk them through kind of a, a proof of concept. We are um, fully understanding that um, you know tools need to be tested. And, and what's great about Threat Locker is that um, we understand when you do deploy Threat Locker, you're going to see things that you did not know were in your environment. You might have an old RMM running, um, or you might have you know files interacting with things that it shouldn't be interacting with. So we're going to show that level of visibility and then show you how we can control it. Um, and that's really what Threat Locker um, has, has made a name for. So for someone that's wanting to uh, kick the tires, if you will, uh, is there a trial available uh, from Fred Locker? Yep, 100%. So um, if you guys do want to take a look at Threat Locker, you can go onto the Threat Locker website um, and hit book a demo. When you do that, we go through that demo, show you exactly what it looks like, and we can even deploy agents on that call and walk you through a trial of exactly what I just said, um, you know, allowing everything to run at first and, and cataloging it and then taking a look at those logs and understanding what needs to be there and then securing it down. So um, being able to kind of go from A to Z, I often say, if you give me an hour a week for five weeks, I will take you zero to zero trust. Um, so that's that's totally something that we're able to offer um, and show you all of that before you you make any decisions on if it's, if it's going to work for you because we fully understand that um, there is some trepidation and anxiety when it comes to blocking everything. 
it sounds scary. We get it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, obviously, you know, it's the fear of the unknown. Um, but, you know, when you provide that support and being able to, you know, uh, you know, give that handholding, um, it probably becomes less and less and less scary as, uh, you know, each day goes on. Right. Yes, 100%. Um, so that that's something that we definitely hold your hand through. We also have a support team that is sub 60 seconds. Um, it could be, it's 24, 24 seven sub 60 second response time. That's actually in the same office as me here in Orlando. They are just above my head. Um, but that team is really a massive resource. Um, you know, being able to, you know, we understand that MSPs run into issues sometimes with their software and with their vendors, and we are not going to be the vendor that takes days to respond. We will always be able to get on a Zoom call right away. It could be two in the morning on Christmas. Well, I got to tell you, I was in um, Orlando in January. Um, I had the opportunity to visit your corporate office. Um, uh, extremely impressive. I mean, you guys have a massive corporate office there. But what I was so intrigued by is um, the dashboards up that were showing the countdown and, um, you know, the, the emphasis on that 60 seconds is, uh, is it really blew me away. So that's, that's pretty cool. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to share with us? I, I, you know, as far as any new products, um, you know, anything additional that, um, you know, you guys have available or got, or coming available that will help MSPs, uh, even more in protecting their clients. Yeah, definitely. And um, we actually had some very exciting news about three months ago at our, our annual trade show here in Orlando called Zero Trust World. Um, but at that show, we released our new product, our, our MDR product. So about a year ago, we came out with an EDR um, and we've always been, you know, the control solution that says layer your security um, with those detection tools. We're not a silver bullet. We don't think that. Um, but we do believe that denying by default is extremely important and layering that security is important. Um, and now with the fact that we have an EDR and an MDR as well, it turns threat locker um, from that, you know, same company that believes in control, layering your security, but also, hey, we believe in control. And now you can layer your security with us if you choose to. I'm sorry, layer your detection with us if you choose to, um, which really turns us into a full endpoint protection platform. And, and one interesting part about the MDR component is that we have been you know, around for eight years and we've seen when you do block by default and stop everything, your threat landscape goes from something that's you know this big down to this big. Um, and your EDR alerts will drop off dramatically. You know, they're dropping off um, 50, 60 percent because of the landscape massively being reduced. Um, so that is you know, fantastic to reduce those alerts. But what if there's other things within that zero trust environment that you'd want to have visibility on? Moving back to my sales example of the sales guys only accessing sales data. We set that up within our zero trust controls, but we could set up another policy within Threat Locker Detect, which is the EDR that says, hey, you know, after 100 files have been moved or, or you know, maybe I go in and move 100 files or, or delete 10 gigabytes of data. Um, and, you know, yes, it's allowed within the zero trust architecture, but I, I could be doing something malicious with that. So within the detect policies, we can say, hey, after X number of files have moved or after X gigabytes of data has been exfiltrated from, you know, this computer, lock him out of the file share or after 10 failed logon attempts, lock him out of the RDP server. So being able to build configurable and actionable policies within your EDR is extremely valuable um, to get the data that is actually relevant to you um, or maybe turn off some, you know, maybe you're getting false positives in your EDR and you don't actually need to see those and you can move those from an alert down to a warning um, and, and kind of more so make your EDR the way you want it to be um, if you choose to. And then the MDR component is us managing that for you, uh, managing those indicators of compromise that come in. Um, and, you know, when you look at a pricing perspective, um, it really is, is impressive to see that, you know, including our MDR and our zero trust controls, we can come in um, and be competitive with a tool that's just doing the managed detection. Um, mm -hmm. Because we understand that if you do deny by default, that that workload is going to be far less and we can pass that pass the ideology through to you in the economics, um, yeah. which has just made my job a whole lot easier. Right. Well, we, we do know that uh, a multi-layered approach is necessary. Um, you know, we, we need to focus on, um, you know, that reactive ability uh, of uh, uh, detection tools, um, but we also have to be proactive. Um, you know, that's uh, where we live in the world uh, today and, and have been, but uh, it is something that needs to be applied and adopted um, 
you know, overall, if someone wants to learn more about ThreatLocker, as uh, Tate mentioned, you can go to ThreatLocker.com, schedule a demo. If you go to EverythingMSP.com as well and you search for ThreatLocker, you can learn more directly um, at EverythingMSP.com. Um, there's also a schedule a demo button right on our site as well. Um, I want to thank everybody for your time today listening to us. Tate, thank you so much for your time as well. I appreciate it. Hope you all have a great rest of your day and we'll talk to you soon. Take care.